today we're going to learn about the importance of solubility versus precipitation in double replacement reactions like the one to form this beautiful yellow precipitate. Precipitation reactions are just a type of double replacement reaction where two soluble reactants, like the ones shown in these test tubes here, react to form an insoluble solid precipitate, like the cloudy blue solid precipitate here on the right. In a double replacement reaction, two ionic compounds, AX and BY, react to form BX and AY. So we have to imagine A and B literally switching places to make the new products BX and AY. Uh, let's not forget where we came from and, and put our reactants back where they go and look at a specific example of sodium hydroxide reacting with copper nitrate and we'll predict the products of this double replacement reaction. So we need to imagine the two metals, sodium and copper, metal ions, switching places. So if we imagine that, we have to imagine sodium coming over here and taking copper's place, and then sodium's new partner will be the nitrate ion. Now, we're going to carry over the subscripts to the product side if they were part of a polyatomic ion. So that means for nitrate, we are going to carry over the three of the nitrate ion, but not necessarily the two. The two will be only present if we need it. We need to redo any drop and cross or check that our ionic formula is overall a balanced formula. So we check on sodium's charge and we find that to be positive one. And we check on nitrate's charge and find out that it's negative. And so since those charges are equal, we just stop. We don't do any drop and cross. So there aren't any parentheses and there isn't a two for nitrate on the product side. And then we can erase those charges once we've got our balanced product. So the next thing we need to do is imagine copper coming over here and taking sodium's place. And if it does that, we've got to list the metal first again. Copper's new partner will be the hydroxide ion. Now again, we need to check the charges and do any dropping and crossing necessary to get the overall ionic formula correct. And to do that, we need copper's charge. And we should notice that copper can be a one plus or a two plus. It's one of those multivalent metals. So we have to figure out what copper metal ion were we dealing with in this equation. So to do that, let's focus first on the nitrate. So let's clean things up here to focus on nitrate. So we know that the nitrate ion has a negative one charge and we have two of them. So we have an overall minus two on the anion side and we need to figure out well, what's copper's charge to balance this. Well, we need two positive charges to balance this out and we only have a presumed one copper available to do that. So that one copper had to have a two plus charge to give us two positives and two negatives because we want those to be overall balanced. So we must be dealing with copper two in this problem. So we're going to put a copper two here. Hydroxide is a negative one and then we need to go ahead and drop and cross here. So even though we didn't have to do any drop and cross for hydroxide, we need to here. We need to make sure that our overall ionic compounds are written correctly on the product side by checking for charge balance and doing any drop and cross. So here we need parentheses and then to drop the two. And then we can erase those charges if we'd like after we finish that. So now the question becomes, what do we need to learn about our solubility versus um, precipitation? So let's check out some solubility rules. 
we have a table of solubility rules on the back of our periodic table. And we need to learn a few terms. When the ionic compound is soluble, that's the same as being aqueous. That means that it's able to be dissolved in water. And so it'll have SOL behind it if it's soluble. And that is going to be true of anything that's aqueous. So we're actually going to end up writing an AQ behind any of the products that say they're soluble. If they're insoluble, that means they don't dissolve, and that means that a solid precipitate is formed because that substance is not soluble in water. It is not aqueous. And if it's slightly soluble, there'll be some solid formed then too, so we'll put an S there too. DNE stands for does not exist, that those products can't be formed. So if we think about the two products that we made, we had copper to hydroxide. So let's look for the intersection of copper and hydroxide. And that says insoluble. So that's going to be our solid product. Let's look for the intersection of sodium and nitrate, and that's going to be soluble. So that will be our aqueous product. So let's go back. Sodium nitrate said it was soluble, so that'll be aqueous. Copper to hydroxide said it was insoluble, so that will be solid. Now everything looks pretty good here, except I would encourage you to pause for a moment and see if you can find anything we haven't taken care of just yet. Did you see that we are unbalanced? So let's go ahead and make an element list and let's combine polyatomics where that's useful and let's try to balance this reaction. We have one sodium and one hydroxide and one copper on the reactant side. There's two of the nitrate polyatomic ions on the product side, one copper two hydroxide ions, one sodium ion, and one nitrate ion. So we might want to double our sodium hydroxide count with a coefficient of two in front of sodium hydroxide so that we'll have two hydroxides. Then we'd need to double our sodium and our nitrate and a two in front of sodium nitrate. We'll take care of that. And now we are balanced too. So our blue cloudy solid here is actually copper to hydroxide solid. And the sodium and nitrate ions would just be to still dissolved in aqueous solution. So let's use these solubility rules to determine if some example compounds are soluble AQ or insoluble solid. This is a good spot to pause and try these five on your own first. I'm going to go on and look for the intersection of sodium and nitrate, and I find out that it's soluble, meaning it will be aqueous and able to dissolve in water. I go to the intersection of silver and bromine and find out that that is an insoluble solid. So it will make a solid precipitate. Um, I go to the intersection then of calcium and bromine. And that one is soluble, so that will be aqueous in solution. Let's find barium and hydroxide. Barium hydroxide is soluble. So 
so that will be aqueous. And then the last one is magnesium phosphate. And so I look for the intersection of magnesium and phosphate, and that is an insoluble solid. Okay, so let's take a look at that classic demonstration that was on the very first slide to make that pretty yellow precipitate. Two reactants are used, potassium iodide and lead nitrate, and they're both clear solutions. So let's see if we can't figure out what that yellow precipitate was on the very first slide. Well, we've got potassium iodide aqueous reacts with lead to nitrate. Now, those charges aren't equal, so we'll have to drop and cross that too. And then we'll need to imagine the lead and potassium switching places. When potassium comes over here, nitrate will be its new partner. And then when lead moves over into potassium spot, iodine will be its new partner. Now, redoing your drop and cross, we'll need to drop two here. Now we'll need to check our solubility rules. So check for the intersection of potassium and nitrate. Maybe you've seen that the nitrates are all soluble, so they're all AQ. Hmm, well, what does that mean for lead iodide? When I look at the intersection of lead and iodine, I see that it is an insoluble solid. That means that that yellow solid precipitate I see forming is lead to iodide. It's got to be solid lead iodide. Now I can erase these charges after I've got my formulas all figured out. But now I know the identity of the solid yellow precipitate. There's one last problem. This reaction's not balanced. I can get myself two nitrates over here with a coefficient of two. I'll need two potassiums and two iodines by putting a two here. And now I'm balanced and I've figured out what my solid precipitate is. So a variety of different solid precipitates can form, but obviously not all ionic compounds form solid precipitates. Some are still soluble. Why are some soluble when others aren't? Let's take just a minute to look at this idea of hydration, of how water molecules surround ions in an ionic solid. So what happens is the slightly positive hydrogen ends of water are going to surround negative ions and pull those off of the main ionic crystal. And then the opposite can also be true, that the slightly negative oxygen ends of water will surround the positive ions and help to pull those away from the ionic crystal structure. And this is how something like sodium chloride, like table salt that we know dissolves in water, is able to be aqueous. Those sodium and chlorine ions are surrounded by water. And the idea here is that the new forces that are formed have to be pretty strong. They have to overcome the old ionic bonds that were present in the crystal structure and overcome some of the existing intermolecular forces between water molecules. So this new intermolecular force has to be pretty strong so that a, an ionic compound can be aqueous. So more and more ions are pulled off of that main crystal structure and hydrated in the case of something like sodium chloride. So what about these insoluble solids? Well, in the case of these insoluble solids, these ionic um, bonds are stronger. They're harder to break and water doesn't manage to overcome them. And the water molecules try 
to hydrate these ions and just aren't able to. And they form these insoluble solid products due to stronger ionic bonds. Now, why might their strength be higher? Well, it could be due to higher charges. We see more solid, insoluble solid precipitates form when there are higher ionic charges in the two plus charges and in the three plus charges. Um, we also see them when ions are able to pack together more closely, that the strength of those ionic bonds might be stronger. But it's really due to stronger ionic bonds that water has a harder time overcoming and isn't able to hydrate. So let's do some examples. This is a perfect time to pause and see if you can predict the products of this double replacement reaction and then predict um, the identity of any um, solid precipitate that forms. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. I'm going to have sodium and silver switch places. Then sodium's new partner will be nitrate. Then silver's new partner will be chlorine. If I check the intersection of sodium and nitrate, I see that it is soluble, aqueous, all the nitrates are. And then I check the intersection of silver and chlorine, and that is an insoluble solid. So there's my solid precipitate, and this one's actually balanced. Let's try the next example. Pause here and see if you can predict the products. Imagine sodium and barium switching places. I'll have sodium partnered up with chlorine. And then barium's new partner will be chromate. Check charges, but these happen to be the same, so they don't need any drop and cross. I can actually erase the charges when I've got their formulas settled. I look for the intersection of sodium and chlorine. I'm familiar with table salt. I've seen it dissolve in water before and I know it's aqueous. Let's look at the intersection of barium and chromate. I've gotta go all the way down here to chromate. And sure enough, that one's insoluble. So that will be my new solid product. I'm not balanced here, I actually need to sodiums and two chlorine ions on the product side. Now I'm balanced and I've predicted my solid product. In our last example, sodium and potassium are gonna switch places. So sodium's new partner is chlorine and potassium's new partner is acetate. Um, charges are all fine, so these compounds are finished. They don't require any drop and cross to get the correct formula. Again, I know table salt's aqueous. I'm going to look for potassium acetate. I'm not so sure about it. Sure enough, soluble, so that's aqueous. Well, wait a second. There's no new solid product formed here. So there's actually no new precipitate here, and we would say no reaction occurred because we didn't see any signs of a chemical change. We didn't see any color change. We did not see any new solid product being formed, and so we would say that there's no reaction here. So unless there's a new insoluble solid precipitate formed, um, there's no reaction if one does not form.